There are some questions in life that have an elevated importance. And how you answer them is critical. There's no room for hemming and hawing, no room for indecisiveness, no room for, for second guessing or any kind of ambiguity whatsoever. For example, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife to have and to hold from this day forward? That's an important question to answer quickly, clearly, concisely, <laughs> accurately. No room for second guessing or, or doubts there at all. I mean, you can't say, well, give me a minute. If you answer that question correctly, you may be faced with this question later on in life. How does this dress make me look? <laughs> Again, no room for second guessing, hemming and hawing. Clarity is of the utmost importance. What about this question? Do you know why I pulled you over? <laughs> you have to answer that very well. <laughs> If you answer that question poorly, you might be faced with this question later on. With your right hand raised, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, <laughs> and nothing but the truth? <laughs> well, this morning's passage revolves around the question of all questions. No question could ever have the significance and importance that this question has. And becomes, it comes to us in the second part of verse 27 when Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? And then again in verse 29, who do you say that I am? This is a question that there can be no indecisiveness with. This is a question that becomes the grid for how you view God, how you view Jesus, how you view eternity, how you view salvation, how you view religion. All of that comes into sharp focus with this question. If the gospel of Mark is compared to summiting a mountain pass, then this passage here this morning is certainly the top of the mountain. Everything in the Gospel of Mark has been building forward towards this question. Everything from this point forward is walking down the other side of the hill. This is the center. This is the focus. This is the critical climax of the Gospel of Mark. Up until this point in the Gospel of Mark, no person has ever called Jesus the Messiah. No person has identified him as the Christ, and nobody has been called to yet. Jesus has never asked anybody before this point if he is the Messiah. Jesus has never asked anybody, who do you think I am? That question has not come up before. Instead, in the background of the Gospel of Mark, for eight chapters, Jesus has been building this comprehensive portfolio of evidence that he is the Messiah. Miracle after miracle, sign after sign. Healing after healing, he's raised the dead, he's given sight to the blind, he's had the, the lame walk, he's fed the tens of thousands. He's walked on the water. He's stopped the storm. He has done miracle after miracle. All of it building up to this question. Who do you think that I am? Well, the answer is somewhat given away back at the beginning of Mark. Mark 1.1. 1, 1. This is the gospel of Jesus, the son of God. When he's baptized by John the Baptist, God's voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The case is already out there that Jesus is the son of God. He's referred to himself as the son of man, but nobody has dared to call him the Messiah, at least not yet. Earlier in Mark, when he healed the man who was demon-possessed, the, the demons came out of him, and the demons called Jesus the Messiah, but a person hasn't yet. In fact, the only person to call Jesus the Messiah to his face happened when Jesus was a, an infant. Remember when Jesus was born, the angels saying that this is the Messiah, this is the Christ. And then he was brought to the temple as a little baby. And Simeon, the, the prophet, the elderly prophet said, now I can depart in peace. Now I can go to glory because God revealed to me, Simeon says, that I would not die until my eyes saw the Messiah. Jesus was a tiny baby when that happened. He couldn't possibly even remember that now. The only other time we've heard somebody identify Jesus as the Messiah was in John chapter 1 when Simon's brother Andrew came and found him and said, come, come with me. I think I found the Messiah. I think I might have found somebody who might be the Messiah is kind of what he said. And Simon and Andrew left their lives and began following Jesus Christ. And now 30 months later, two and a half years later, Jesus is alone with them and he asks them that question. 
Who do you think I am? The geography of this question is important. Look at verse 27. Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is the northernmost city in, in Israel. It's not really even during the time of Christ politically inside of Israel. It's this territory that was carved out for King Philip to rule. It wasn't under Herod. It wasn't under any of the Herod family. It wasn't connected to Herod. So a lot of Israelites that wanted to flee the brutal reign of Herod would go to Caesarea Philippi. It's part of what used to be Israel in the Old Testament under David and Solomon. It was all Israel. This is the northernmost city of Israel back in the Old Testament. It's the place where the Israelite kings put the golden cow and declared that this was their God. That was the city. It was rebuilt by Philip, who ruled over this state for 57 years, putting his stamp on it. He rebuilt it, and he named it after himself. But of course, because of his humility, he didn't just call it Philip. He called it Caesarea Philippi. He added Caesar's name to it. That allowed him to get away with it, I assume. It was a place where people worshipped a god who was half goat, half man, and they declared that to be their deity, not far removed from Israelites worshiping the golden cow. This is Caesarea Philippi. Now in the Gospel of Mark, it's important to understand what's happening here. Jesus, for two years of ministry, had been ministering almost entirely in Galilee, the area where he was from, where he was raised, where all the disciples are from. He spent two years ministering there. Then he left for six months and went on a tour of the Gentile nations around there to, through Sire and Tidon and Arabia and Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. And now he's re-entered back into Israel where he was rejected by the Pharisees and the priests again. And in a final rejection, Jesus said that they're broken off. No more signs will be given to Israel. No more ministry will be done for Israel. No more teaching will be given them. They are broken off. They are done. And Jesus then leaves with his 12 disciples up towards Caesarea Philippi. It's stunning to see how the Gospel of Mark is structured. The first eight and a half chapters are all about those first two years of Jesus' ministry. Half of the Gospel is about those two years. The next few chapters, the last part of eight, nine, and ten, are all about Jesus' ministry in Caesarea Philippi. It's a few weeks long. Mark goes through two years of Jesus' life in eight chapters and then spends three chapters just in a few weeks. And then Jesus walks from Caesarea Philippi in a straight line from the northernmost point of Israel all the way down to Jerusalem where he'll be crucified. And Mark spends the rest of his gospel there. Half of the gospel is spent in those three weeks of Jesus' life. This is the beginning of that penultimate section of Jesus' life. This is the beginning of his ministry in Caesarea Philippi. And he starts it all with this question. Two and a half years have gone by. The disciples have seen outrageous, phenomenal, inexplicable signs and wonders. And there Jesus has his time alone with them and he confronts them with this question. Who do people think I am? Another way of asking that question is, where is everybody? Where is everybody? Tens of thousands were fed. Tens of thousands saw his miracles. He healed everybody in Galilee. He drove out sickness and illness from Palestine. He taught with authority unrivaled in human history. Everybody saw this from him. But now it's just Jesus and the 12. Where is everybody? Why are they alone with him on the road? Where did the masses go? How could they possibly see all that Jesus could do and not follow him? Why do people not surrender all they have and give up this earthly life to follow Jesus Christ? That's another way of rephrasing this question. Where is everybody? How can they possibly dismiss everything they saw? I mean, who do they think Jesus is? Well, the disciples have all the wrong answers. The crowd thinks that you could be John the Baptist, Elijah, One of the prophets. I mean, they're ridiculous answers. John the Baptist? John the Baptist baptized Jesus. They were seen in the same room together at the same time. They can't be the same person. Maybe they think that Jesus' miracles really came into fruition after John was, was killed, as if, you know, the spirit of John the Baptist descended upon Jesus. I mean, it's a ridiculous idea. Others say that he could be Elijah, because, of course, in the Old Testament, Elijah was... The prophet that was supposed to prepare the way for the Messiah. That's just simply a way for people to escape identifying Jesus as the Messiah. We don't have to give up everything and follow him. I mean, he could just be Elijah. And other people say he's just a prophet. I mean, that's an answer you hear today. Jesus is just a good religious teacher. 
He's one of many prophets. He's a, a good religious teacher. You can learn a lot from him. That's what the crowd was saying back then. He's a prophet. Like all the prophets in the Old Testament, there's nothing special with them. Israel killed all them. Of course, they'll kill this one too. It's that kind of attitude. That's what the world says about Jesus. I mean, these answers are so ridiculous, they don't even bear being dealt with by the disciples. They don't argue with them. They just dismiss them all. And Jesus does as well. And then Jesus barrels down the question, puts his scope right on the 12. Verse 29, Jesus continued by questioning them. But, and that but is contrastive here, but compared to what all the wrong answers of the world, instead of those answers, who do you say that I am? This is that defining question. There's no room for second guessing or partial answers. You have to be clear and definitive. And that'll lead to our outline this morning. This, Peter's answer begins with a spiritual confession. We'll call this part the spiritual confession. Spiritual confession. In verse 29, Peter answered, speaking for the 12. He was their leader. He was their spokesman. Peter answers for the group and said to Jesus, you are the Christ. That word Christ, it's a Greek word, Christos. It's just most English translations, for reasons I don't really understand, don't even translate the word. They just transliterate it. They take the Greek letters and bring it straight on into English and you get the word Christ. If you were to translate the word, it would be Messiah. Peter answers and says, you are the Messiah. You're the Christ, the Messiah. The Messiah is an Old Testament figure prophesied in the Old Testament. There's prophecies about the Messiah all over the Old Testament, beginning all the way back in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve fell into sin. God came and he told Adam and Eve, one of your offspring will crush the head of Satan. That would be the Messiah, a descendant of Adam and Eve, tempted by the devil and yet sinless, victorious over the devil's temptation. Unlike Adam and Eve, who when tempted by the devil fell, the Messiah will be tempted by the devil and not fall. That's the Messiah. He'll be the true son of Adam. He'll be the true descendant of Abraham from the prophecy in Genesis 12. He will be the, the heir of Abraham, the offspring of Abraham who will bring peace between God and the nations. That's the promise to Abraham. He'll be a blessing to the nations by restoring peace between God and mankind. How will he do that? Well, the promise to Abraham is he'll do that by teaching salvation by faith alone. That Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And Abraham's true offspring, the true seed, will be a preacher of that kind of salvation. Salvation by faith alone. The Messiah will be a true descendant of the person Israel, Jacob, renamed Israel. He'll be Jewish in the flesh. He'll be a true descendant of Judah. He'll be a king over Israel. The Messiah will be a true descendant of Moses. He'll be a lawgiver like Moses was. Although Moses' law led to bondage and to works the Messiah's law will lead to freedom and righteousness, bringing eternal life. The Messiah will be the true offspring of David. He'll be a ruler over his people. He'll be a king, a man after God's own heart. When you summarize all of those prophecies, the Messiah would be sinless and victorious over the devil. He'll be Jewish in preaching salvation by faith alone. He'll be the son of God and the son of man. He'll rule Israel as their king while rescuing the world from their sin, all while fulfilling every single law in the Old Testament and every single Old Testament prophecy. That's who the Messiah will be. For 400 years, God has broken off communication with Israel. For 400 years, he hasn't sent them a single prophet. He hasn't given them any new revelation. For 400 years, Israel was left in their self-made darkness, groping for the light, wondering when the Messiah would come. By the time Jesus does come to the world, there's this obvious messianic expectation in Israel. They know the next prophetic event on God's timeline will be the advent of the Messiah, the birth of the Messiah into the world. And he will fulfill all of those things that I just described. Do you see the weight that is on this question? 400 years go into this question, much less two and a half years of Jesus' ministry. All of the Old Testament prophecies go into this question. So when Andrew said, Peter, follow, I think I might have found the Messiah, that's what he meant. Nobody else has called Jesus the Messiah to his face. Do you remember the blind man in John chapter 9 when, who Jesus healed? They brought him into the synagogue and they said, do you think he's the Messiah? And he refused to answer. 
And the Pharisees made a rule. Anybody who calls Jesus the Messiah will be excommunicated, thrown out of the Jewish religion, banished from the synagogues and the temple. But nobody other than the demons have said it to Jesus' face. And now for the first time, the question is leveled at Peter. And he doesn't bunt. He says, you are the Messiah. The one declared by angels at your birth to be the Savior. This is you, Jesus. You. For the first time it's said to Jesus' own ears. And Jesus approves of Peter's answer. We don't see this here recorded in the Gospel of Mark because Mark is recorded from Peter's perspective. Mark was not an eyewitness to these events, but Mark spent a lot of time with Peter, and the Gospel of Mark is Peter's version of these events, inspired by the Holy Spirit without flaw or without error. But Peter leaves out what Jesus says in response to this question because of his humility, I think. But Matthew records that when Peter says, Peter says, you're the Christ, Jesus, and the Gospel of Matthew says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But it comes from the Spirit of God. Only God's Spirit can cause somebody to make this kind of confession. It would take God's Spirit working on the heart to get somebody to do what Peter has done here. To leave his life. He's left his extended family. He's left his job. He's left his occupation. He's left his hometown. He has left everything. He doesn't have any money in his pocket. They hardly have food most of the time. They have no place to lay their head. They have walked away. These 12 have walked away from their life for the sake of following Jesus Christ. And now they've said out loud, you are the Messiah. This is not a superficial recognition of Jesus as the Messiah. I mean, it's obvious he's the Messiah. When you take all of his works into account, which the disciples saw all of it, it's obvious he's the Messiah. But that's not even what this confession is about. It's about they've left everything to follow him. This is not the work of the flesh. This is not superficial saying, oh, I guess you're the Messiah. This was not the process of elimination through all the wrong answers. This was the weight of the obvious being laid on Peter's heart. The work of the Spirit on his heart with Peter putting his faith in the Messiah. That's why Jesus says this comes from the Spirit of God. This is the way the Apostle Paul says it later in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now we've received not the Spirit of this world. Notice this phrase that Jesus uses in Matthew. But the Spirit who's from God. When Peter confesses this, Jesus says, you have the Spirit who's from God. And Paul describes it this way. So that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Jesus didn't hold back his revelation. He didn't hold back his miracles. He revealed himself completely to Israel. But it requires God's Spirit working in the heart to have somebody turn from their life and follow Christ. Paul goes on. These are things that we also speak. Not in words taught by human wisdom but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. This is what Peter did. He's seen the spiritual teaching of Jesus throughout the last two and a half years. He's seen the miracles. He's taking those spiritual thoughts. He's putting them into spiritual words, and he's confessing that Jesus is the Messiah. This is a work of God in his heart. Paul simplifies that whole verse later in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, and just says it this way. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This is exactly what Peter experienced. Like I said, this is not a superficial, flippant, mental granting that Jesus is the Messiah. This is a profound change in a human heart. Surrendering his life, laying it down, picking up his cross to follow Jesus, which is what Jesus describes in the passage we'll look at next week. This is abandoning this world for the sake of following Christ. This is looking around and seeing nobody else in the world on the road, just the 12 disciples, and saying, we are here because you are the Messiah. We've left everything because you are the Messiah. You cannot say that except from the work of God on the human heart. It's a work of the Spirit, which leads to the second part of our outline, a sacrificial substitution, a sacrificial substitution. Jesus, in verse 30, warns them to tell nobody about him. That doesn't mean they're supposed to be quiet with all aspects of who Jesus is. It means they're not supposed to tell people that he's the Messiah. Not yet. Because that's not the full message. 
we become accustomed to this warning in the Gospel of Mark. Six or seven times so far in Mark, does Jesus tell people, don't tell anybody about me. It's happened over and over and over again, and we've talked about this. It's because the message is not that Jesus is a healer. That's not the message to take to the world. The message is not even that Jesus is the Messiah. That's not the full message. We're not left guessing why he says it. He goes on to elaborate in verse 31. Jesus began to teach them. Began meaning right here in Caesarea Philippi. He's going to spend a few weeks teaching them this. That the Son of Man, that's a title for the Messiah from the book of Daniel, must suffer many things. Jesus doesn't even go into all the details of what he'll suffer here because the disciples couldn't bear it at this moment. It would, it would break them. He doesn't go into the details of the whipping. He doesn't go into the details of the mock trials and the, the profound humiliation that goes with that. He doesn't go into the details of his betrayal and he doesn't describe the cross. He just says, I am going to suffer many things and then be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, the three groups of religious leaders that oversee Israel, the elders, the ones who lead the synagogues, the the religious leaders, the scribes, the ones who guard the law, the Pharisees, the one who interpret the law, all of them compiled together will reject Jesus as the Messiah. That word reject is a phenomenal word. It doesn't just mean to to cast aside or to say no. It's a, we might translate it in English. It, it has to do with currency. It means you take a piece of currency. You hold it up to the light. You examine it. You weigh it to see if it's the appropriate amount. You look for any imperfections on it. And if you decide that it's counterfeit, you cast it aside. That's what this word is. He's describing this final week of his life. He'll spend a week in Jerusalem under the microscope of the Pharisees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the elders will look at Jesus' life for a week. They will try to trick him. They will try to stump him. They will ask him question after question. They will listen to his teaching in the temple. They will give him an examination unparalleled through his ministry. They will, will bring him through the ringer to see if he's the Messiah. And after looking at him so carefully... They will reject him as a counterfeit, throw him away, and then the Messiah will be killed, murdered, and after three days, he'll rise again. Jesus goes on to describe the sacrifice. Now, he had hinted at his death earlier. Remember, he had said he compared himself to the temple. He said, my body is like this temple. You can tear it down and three days later it'll be raised back again. And John says nobody knew what he was talking about. But now he's speaking plainly. He set aside figures of speech. He's not speaking figuratively in the passage that we read earlier in John 16. He's setting that aside and he's speaking directly to them. I will suffer. I will be murdered. This is a substitutionary death. He's not being murdered just because they rejected them. He's being murdered because he's dying in the place of sinners. He's bearing the weight of sin on his shoulders. He is going to give his life in exchange for the people whom God has given him. He was sent to seek and to save the lost. And the only way to seek and to save here is to surrender his life and be crucified. So the wrath of God that should be poured out on sinners will be poured out on Jesus instead. That's why he's going to be killed. This is why the religious leaders reject him because Jesus is saying the only way to have eternal life is to believe that the Messiah died in your place. You can't have eternal life by being a good person. You can't have eternal life by trying hard. You can't have eternal life by just doing the best that you can do. You don't go to heaven when you die if you lived a life that just tried to be good and to measure up to your own standards. That's a life that leads to hell. You don't go to heaven when you die by following another religion. Every other religion leads you to hell. The only way you can have salvation is by having Jesus suffer and die in your place. This is why he says, a word that we glanced over earlier, verse 31, the Son of Man must suffer these things. He must do so. This is not one of many ways to have eternal life. This is the only road to heaven right here is through the Messiah suffering and dying. If you think there's another way to gain eternal life, then Jesus didn't have to die. Do you remember his prayer before he was murdered? He said, Father, if there is another way, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way to be saved, don't make Jesus suffer and die is what his prayer was. 
Nevertheless, Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus didn't delight in the suffering, but he delighted in the rescue. He didn't run from the suffering. He ran to the cross because by bleeding and dying, he dies as our substitute. Our sin placed on him. There is no other way to salvation. This is the message. This is why the disciples can't go to the world telling everybody he's the Messiah because they don't understand the cross yet. Going to the world and telling the world that he's the Lord, he's the Messiah, that would lead people to hell. That would give them this idea that they had religious insight without the most essential piece of the puzzle. There's all kinds of people that call Jesus Lord that are on their way to hell because they think that their religion leads them to eternal life. There's all kinds of people that call Jesus the Lord and they even do miraculous signs and wonders in his name that will go to hell when they die because they have not surrendered their life and believe that Jesus died in their place. They'll even say when they die, Lord, Lord, didn't I know you? This is why Jesus tells them, you can't tell anybody about this because it's not the full picture. The news that you take to the world is not only that Jesus is the Messiah. All kinds of people will make superficial declarations that Jesus is Lord and be radically confounded when they die. Only the message that he dies in our place, that he's the Messiah, and he's the Messiah who suffered and died for sinners and rose victorious from the grave on the third day. As our substitute, that's the message that saves. And so they're told, don't go into the world yet. Don't go into the world yet. Well, that leads to the demonic rejection. The demonic rejection. Jesus' description of his death and suffering would have shocked the disciples, and shocked is not even the right word. They had no grid for this. If this passage is seen, viewed the disciples on an emotional roller coaster, they just were at the top a second ago. I mean, for two and a half years, 30 months, this tension has been building. Is he the Messiah? Is he the Messiah? Is he the Messiah? They finally confess that he's the Messiah. Jesus says, this is the spirit of God. And there's such joy in the disciples' hearts. There's such anticipation. All the messianic hope is about to be realized. He's the Messiah. It was worth it for us to leave everything. We have found the Messiah. They thought the Messiah would come to Jerusalem, overthrow the Roman rule, usher in this glorious era of Israelite history, forgiving them from their sins, making peace between God and and Israel, being received as a king like David was received. Oh, imagine the golden days of David. That's what they thought they were going towards. What joy and anticipation and excitement they must have had at that moment. And five seconds later, Jesus crushes it and says, no, I'm going to suffer and die. I think of a a silly human analogy to this. Imagine telling your children you're going to take them to Disney World. And instead, you pull over at the Library of Congress and (laughs) let them spend the afternoon reading. Jesus just said he was the Messiah. Think of what's going through the disciples' minds, and then he tells them, I'm going to go be murdered. They don't have a grid for this. It's like they got to the line of scrimmage, and he's calling an audible. This is not the play. This is not the prophecies. They don't understand yet that the prophecies about the suffering servants were also true of the Messiah. They have not put those two different pieces of the puzzle together yet. They don't realize that. They have all the messianic prophecies, but they don't understand the Old Testament prophecies about God crushing his son were also about the Messiah. They don't have that in their minds yet. And so Jesus rocks their world. And Peter, again, speaking for the 12, steps up. Say what you will about Peter, but he's their spokesman, and he's bold, and he puts his arm around Jesus, and it says he leads Jesus aside from the group. And this is 
I'm going to attribute the best motives to Jesus here. He's trying to be kind to Jesus. He doesn't want to embarrass Jesus in front of the, the rest of the group. This is the example of, you know, the second in command speaking to the commanding officer saying, can I talk to you privately for a second? Before you go back in the room and repeat what you just said, I have some more information for you. <laughs> Peter puts his arm around him and leads him aside. And he begins to tell him, you're not going to go be murdered. They'll have to get through me to get to you, and that's not going to happen. But Jesus interrupts him. Mark says he began to say this. It began meaning he just got the first few words out of his mouth. But verse 33, turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. This is a detail that only Mark provides, probably because it came directly from Peter. Matthew doesn't tell us the, the details of how this happened, but when you put it all together, Peter put his arm around Jesus, leads him aside from the group. They get aside and Peter starts to tell him, you're not going to do this. And Jesus stops and turns and looks at Peter and behind him looks at the 11 and you have all 12 of them together and Peter speaks, Jesus speaks loud enough for all 12 to hear and he gives Peter a rebuke unparalleled in human history probably. He tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, on God's interest, but on man's. Just seconds earlier, Peter was told that he was speaking with the power of the Holy Spirit. And now he's told he's speaking with the power of the devil. And this is a very real way, exactly how the devil tempted Adam and Eve. Do you remember in the garden? The devil went to Adam and Eve and said, you don't want eternal life. You don't want eternal life. You want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. The food looks good. Take it and have it and set aside God's promise for eternal life. And they fell for it. That's this exact temptation here. Jesus, you don't want to give people eternal life by dying for them. You want to reign as their, as their leader and their ruler. You don't want to give up your life for them. This is exactly how the devil tempted Jesus face to face in the wilderness. Do you remember? He said, why die? Instead, have authority over all the kingdoms of the world. The devil says, I'll give that to you right now. You won't need to suffer and die. You can rule the world right now. They'll go to hell when they die, but you will be their ruler and you will escape this death. That is the exact same temptation Peter is laying out for Jesus. Don't go to the cross. Peter doesn't realize all that he's saying here. He doesn't realize that he's condemning the world to hell by his advice. He's just trying to rescue his Messiah from a painful death. But Jesus knows. He knows that there's no half answers with this question. He knows that if he is the Messiah, he must suffer and die. And that salvation cannot be accomplished apart from the death of our Savior. I want you to understand how this passage all fits together. The progression through this passage. It begins with the, the spiritual confession. That through the working of the Spirit... Peter says, you are the Messiah. You're the Savior. And Jesus unfolds to him that the full message is not just that he's the Messiah, but the full message is that there's a cross, there's death, there's a substitutional sacrifice of the Savior. And then he will rise from the grave victoriously, offering eternal life to all who would believe. That's the message. And Peter thinks there's another way. Peter implies that you don't need to have the Savior die. You don't need to put your faith in him as the Messiah and his death and his resurrection to have eternal life. And that's demonic. Do you understand that when you're confronted with the question, who do you say Jesus is? There's only two answers. And one is provoked by the Spirit of God and one is provoked by the devil himself. Even if you don't believe in the supernatural, you fall under the authority of one or the other. This is why Paul says in Ephesians 2, all those who, who don't believe in the Messiah, all those people live their lives under the power of the prince of the air. If you believe that there's another way to have salvation, you are under the authority of the devil, even if you don't believe in him. This confirms the scripture's teaching that all false religions are demonically inspired. Because they're all offering ways to eternal life that don't involve the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
You can believe that he's the Messiah and still be on your way to hell if you don't believe that his death is what gives you your salvation, that your faith in his death and resurrection gives you your salvation. If you reject that principle, then then you're following the devil. If you think salvation comes from confessing your sins or keeping sacraments, then you are under the authority of the devil. If you think that salvation comes by being born into a certain family or certain social status, then you're under the authority of the devil. If you think that you can have salvation by keeping the five pillars of your religion, then you're under the authority of the devil. If you think that you can have salvation by keeping one day a week holy, then you're under the authority of the devil. If you think that you can have salvation by being a good person and by living to the best of your ability and by being moral and by trying hard and caring for your family, then you're under the authority of the devil. It doesn't matter what flavor of poison you buy into. All of that puts you on a road that leads to hell. The only rescue is to believe that the Son of God, the Son of Man, is the Messiah in human flesh and that He died in exchange for the punishment that we deserved. That He rose from the grave offering newness of life to all who would believe. That is the only road. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and apart from him, no one can have eternal life. There is no other way. If there was another way, he wouldn't have said, the son of man must suffer and die. There is no other road to salvation. And clinging to one of those other roads, clinging clinging to your own moralism, your own religion, your own self-righteousness, all of that is clinging to the lies of the devil. I'm thankful that Peter tried to dissuade Jesus from the cross because it provoked from him his most stunning rebuke in his ministry, which is saying a lot. I'm thankful Peter said, you don't need to die because that attitude was unmasked by the devil, was unmasked by Jesus as being demonic. What about you? Every one of us is confronted with that same question. Who do you say that I am? There's no partial answers that are acceptable. There's a right answer and there's a wrong answer. How would you explain that to somebody? Who do you say Jesus is? The full answer is that he's the Messiah. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies. He's the fulfillment of the law. And he's the substitute for sinners. That he died in our place. And that he rose from the grave because he bore the penalty that sin demands. And he paid it in full. And he rose in victorious newness of life. That's who Jesus Christ is. And that is the only way to have salvation. Is by putting your faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ.